Okay, so let's go through this measure. So I, I'll be honest with you, there's actually two reasons you have to stay at this sport over 21. Okay? One is not only is it indicative of major uh, depression issues, but two, the fact depression in the 40s is also sensitive to cardiac issues. 
And if you score over 21, it could be that you have depression or it could be that you're having cardiac issues. And it's highly predictive of a heart attack. So that's why <laughs> if you score over that, I need to just check in on you. I just want to make that clear. It's not that I'm going to be depressed and angry. But uh, we also might need to go get your heart checked. So uh, just a side note on that. So the way you can interpret this is if you score between a 1 and a 10, you're normal. You're OK. You go through regular mood swings, that kind of stuff. 11 to 16, it's a mild mood disturbance. And what I would recommend if you got 11 to 16 is take this again in like three or four weeks. Okay. If you get a similar score, you may want to explore the issues. Okay. If you scored between a 17 to a 20, you should probably take this uh, uh, about four more times over the next week or two. So you took it today, I would take it again on Sunday, and then maybe Tuesday, Thursday, and then next Saturday. And see if the scores fluctuate in any way. If they stay in that 17 to 20 range, then you probably should go see somebody. If they go down, it might just be that you're having, again, I'm gonna say this, it might be that you're just having a few little heart issues that are going on, or it might just be because of the, the, the emotions of today or something like that, okay? If you score above a 21, you have to stay and talk to me uh, because that's indicative of uh, moderate depression, but it's also indicative of, like I said, cardiac issues, suicide, uh, suicidal ideation, and all those kinds of things. So I do have to check in with you. So um, if you score between 31 and 40 or just 31 and above, um, we really need to talk, okay? Um, because that's, that's, that's an issue, okay? So that's kind of how you would interpret this back depression inventory as you're thinking about your score and whatnot. So, um, but again, it can go two directions for the back. It can go to depression or it can go to cardiac issues. So just be aware of that. Any questions on that? What did you think about reading those questions? What did you notice? that you can state about depression. What's that? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. It's almost like you're giving up on life if you read those questions closely, right? What's that? And hopeless, like you can't escape it, right? Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, depression in general, okay? Uh, most people will experience depression at some point in, in, in their life, okay? It's almost one of those unescapables that we all, that we all are susceptible to. Um, however, the question becomes, when do you need intervention for depression, okay? And there's two kind of key indicators. Uh, one, if it's persistent over time, when we look at this, it'll give the timetables, you know, it should be more than like six weeks, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what, I, what I'll say to that is research has shown that untreated depression will resolve itself 90% of the time after 90 days, okay? Meaning that when we look at cases of untreated depression, the majority of it resolves itself after about 90 days. If the symptoms continue beyond that, then there's more significant issues that probably need intervention, okay? The other part besides time is if the formation of suicidal ideation starts to develop. And, or the inability to function normally in life. So even if you're within that 90 days and you just can't get up and go to work or you can't get through the day, then it's time to go get some more serious intervention, okay? 
Um, as far as uh, depression is concerned, um, th there's two types of models that, that, that are used in the treatment of depression. One is the medical model, and if you want to think of it this way, the medical model is, is we're going to medicate it, okay? And, and that's going to resolve it. We're going to treat it kind of like diabetes. So we're going to give you a drug, and that's going to mask the symptoms or alleviate the symptoms, and that alleviation is good enough, okay? Um, versus the biopsychosocial model. I should first start with the medical model, though, because what do antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications do? A lot of people assume that those medications are meant to make you feel better, to make you feel happy, to make you feel like life is worth living, okay? That's not true, okay? I want you to think of it this way. You break your leg, you go in and get treatment for it. Does the doctor state your leg is gonna be better than what it was before? I'm gonna build you a better, happier, stronger leg? No. His hope is that it might get back to some close variation of what your leg was like before you broke it. Okay? Meaning what he wants to do is get your leg back into what we call a homostatic state. Okay? Homostatic means complete balance. And that is what the medical model is based upon, is that if everything is in balance, you are treated. Okay, so it's kind of like when you go get your blood test, right? If your blood are in the normal range, they, they say you're healthy, you're fine, right? Because that's homostatic, okay? What is a homostatic mood state? How about it's no mood at all? A homostatic balanced mood means that you have no mood at all, neither positive nor negative, because that is balance. Okay. That is the purpose of psychotropic drugs. Antidepressants are not meant to make you feel better. They're meant to make you feel nothing because nothing is a homostatic balanced state, okay? So a lot of people who get on antidepressants and they, they get off right away because they don't feel anything, well, they're actually being treated according to the medical model because they're not supposed to be feeling anything. Psychotropic drugs are meant to make you feel nothing because that is a balanced state of mood, okay? So now we can balance that so we have that medical model. And if you go to your physician, that's what he or she will be working towards, okay? Now we can converse that with a biopsychosocial model, okay? The biopsychosocial model states that we need three forms of intervention. We need to look at your biology, so that may include medication, it may not. We need to look at your thought processes psychological state because with depression we often find that they get stuck in a cognitive state okay where they state okay where they start off with some some thought like I am a loser and worthless okay and what they do is they look for evidence that will reinforce that initial thought. So it'll start off with, I'm a loser and I'm worthless because I'm a bad parent, uh, because my kids aren't happy. I am a loser and I'm worthless because uh, I don't do as good as everyone else at the work. Because I don't do good, I'm worthless, therefore I'm bad at work. I'm bad at work, therefore I'm worthless. You see how circular that 
this. Okay. And for a person with depression, the psychological or cognitive state is they get stuck in this circular thinking. I'm worthless. Therefore, I suck at my job. I suck at my job. Therefore, I'm worthless. Okay. And actually, in, with someone with major depression, breaking that circular thought process is probably one of the hardest things to do. Uh, you can change their behavior. You can medicate the shit out of them. You can change their social relationships. You can do all of that. But breaking that circular thinking is the hardest thing to help someone with depression do. Okay. Um, the second uh, issue is you have to deal with the social world. Um, Sigmund Freud once said, before you diagnose yourself with depression, be sure you're just not surrounded by assholes. Okay. Um, <laughs> because a lot of what drives depressive symptoms is the company the person keeps. Okay. Because they are also going to be reinforcing those cognitive circles. Okay. And so the social aspect is helping a depressed person change their mental model about the friends and people they should be keeping around them. Okay. Because you can change the situation and you can change the person. Right. So we have found though that the combination of these three things, combination of medication, uh, psychotherapy, tend to be the best uh, treatment. Individually, do they work? To some degree, yes or no. Together, do they work? Yes, significantly, meaning you have a greater than 50% chance of success, okay? So <clears throat> depression is probably one of those that is uh, has organic features, and then it has this uh, good mix of the psychological and social mixture as well, okay? Now, we should talk a little bit really quick about the medication aspect, okay? Over the recent decades, <laughs> they have started to introduce different antidepressants that work on different neurotransmitters that are starting to have a little bit more success here and there. But there's the issues with the uh, medication issues and antidepressants, okay? The medical model of depression states that depression occurs when a person has lowered levels of serotonin in the brain. That theory comes from uh, the medication that was first introduced to try and treat depression, which was a Prozac type medication. What Prozac is, is an SSRI. It's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, meaning basically what it does is it puts more serotonin in the brain for the brain to use. Okay. So the uh, theory of depression isn't based on actual anatomy of the brain. It's based on this drug that seemed to work in the alleviation of depression, all right? So this is going to be, again, one of those academic conversations, not a real life clinical conversations. So let's look at the evidence for <coughs> the serotonin theory of depression, okay? There was recently a review of 12 studies that looked at serotonin levels in the brain. The only real way to measure how much neurochemicals you have in your brain is uh, biopsy after death, okay? You could, I could scan your brain as much as I want and I can't tell you if you have this much serotonin and this much dopamine and this much that. No, the only way I could tell is if you let me cut your brain apart when you're dead, okay? Which I doubt any of you are gonna want me to do, thank you. No, I'm kidding, okay? Um, so the only way to test the serotonin theory is uh, biopsy after death, okay? And there's been 12 studies that have uh, biopsied the brains of depressed people, okay? 
And the most interesting, of course, are people who had depression that didn't get any treatment, right? Because what you would expect is, is that they would all have reduced levels of serotonin, okay? But out of these 12 studies, only one found reduced levels of serotonin in the depressed brain. 11 studies found, uh, 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 what is it? the same level or slightly above serotonin levels compared to non-depressed brains, okay? So the serotonin theory actually doesn't hold up in reality, in actual measurable amounts, okay? So the question is, is why do antidepressants work? And that's a very, and to be honest with you, that's a very good question. We don't know, <laughs> okay? Um, and in fact, the issue with the serotonin theory and all of that is if it was serotonin or if it was chemicals, everybody should react to it the same. But some people will react to a SSRI, while others will react to something like Wellbutrin. Well, Wellbutrin works on the dopamine system. It doesn't work on the serotonin system. Okay. And then there's some depressed people that have bad reactions to Wellbutrin and bad re reactions to something like Prozac, okay? So it is probably more likely that within the depressed brain, it's a combination of different neurochemicals that are interacting dysfunctionally. And what we hope is we find the right pill that helps balance that person's brain off uh, but what I would say is this, is, is if you're going to use medication for depression, don't get frustrated if the first pill doesn't work. Get with a good doctor, hopefully a psychiatrist, who will work with you in trying to find the right combination of medication that will work, because the first tryout probably won't work. You only have about 50% chance that the first medication you use for depression will actually work. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. All right. So here is a quick video. No, that looks boring. Okay. So let's go through the major criteria, diagnosis <laughs> criteria for depression. So for depression, you have to have five or more of the following symptoms um, and at least one of the symptoms has to be a depressed mood or it has to be a loss of interest or pleasure. So one of them has to be one of these two things, okay? So depressed mood is uh, nearly every day the subject reports feeling sad, empty, hopeless, or upon observation, they feel tearful. And usually, this is something kind of interesting when you're, when you're looking at children and adolescents, is depression in children actually looks like anxiety, okay? So if your kid is, especially for five to six years old, if your kid is acting anxious, it's probably more likely that they have depression than anxiety. If they're acting depressed and withdrawn, it's more likely that they have anxiety, okay? So if you're evaluating your kiddos or someone's child, whether they're depressed or anxious, remember in childhood and in adolescence, depression looks like anxiety and anxiety looks like depression when you're observing it. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind when you're, when you're looking at your kids or whatnot, okay? Uh, number two is a mark diminished in, in interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities, most days, nearly every day, okay? And this can be either a subjective account or uh, observation. Usually when we're talking observation, this is when we're observing a child or an adolescent and want to build evidence for uh, any given situation. So 
for major depression, they have to have one of these two. And then in addition, they have to have at least three of these, okay? One includes uh, significant weight loss when not dieting or weight gain. And we, we do that by the, the kind of the standard is a change of uh, body mass of at least five body weight by five months within a month, 5% within a month, okay? Or decrease or increase in appetite, okay? Um, the, this in children too, this is another notation because children have such a higher metabolism than, than adults. So you really have to look at this appetite increase or decrease with kiddos because they may not gain any significant amount even though they are eating a lot more. Um, insomnia or hypersomnia, meaning either they can't sleep at all or they sleep all the time. Uh, psychomotor, motor, <laughs> psychomotor agitation and retardation nearly every day. So what do you think psychomotor agitation or retardation is? Yeah, everything kind of gets to you. So agitation is just don't talk to me today. I can't handle you. That's what that kind of sounds like. And that's what we mean by psychomotor agitation. Okay. Uh, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. Uh, and of course, feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt. Um, uh, one of the things that I notice about a lot of people that I work with with depression is they take 100% uh, uh, responsibility for everything that goes wrong in their life. So for example, uh, a really depressed person who's having issues in their relationship will come in and go, I'm responsible for every single problem in our relationship. I'm 100% responsible. She or he has nothing to do with it. I am the problem, okay? That's one, <laughs> this, this highlights two points of depression. Um, one is, is the need to keep that thought process that you're worthless and you're, and whatnot, but also it goes back to the Freud statement about making sure you're not surrounded by assholes. Um, uh, Diminished ability to concentrate or indecisiveness and reoccurrent thoughts of death or not just fear of dying. And this is the important thing is that uh, uh, suicide, uh, depressed people's, you know, in normal conversation when we talk about death, there's usually an element of fear, right? So you're like, I don't know what to expect, it kind of scares me, blah, blah, blah. For a depressed person, that fear is eliminated. It's gone. You won't even know, know that they are scared of death. It's just gone. And that's kind of what that means. Okay, so you have to have three of these. And then uh, the other part is, is in part B, the symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of function. The episode is not attributed to physiological effects of substance abuse or another medication, medical, medi medical condition. This is another one of those disorders that, um, I'm trying to think of them. Well, we know that it's related to uh, cardiac issues because of the back depression in the body. Uh, but there's also other type of medications. There's a diabetic medication. And then there's a medication that you take, uh, there's a, <coughs> Uh, what are the drugs that help you fight bacteria? Uh, like a penicillin, those type, it's a certain type, antibiotic. There are certain antibiotics that will cause depressive symptoms, okay? And that's why you wanna make sure you cover the substance and medical condition issues first before you go put them on some psychotropic or some type of therapy have their heart checked out, make sure they're not on, on the, those, and uh, check and see if they have diabetes. <laughs> yes. 
So you have to have either one or two. A one of one and two. Yeah, one of one and two, and three of three to nine. So this, this next one, which is called persistent depressive disorder or dysthemia, this is a low-grade depression that is hugely persistent, meaning they've had this low-grade dysthymic depression, and it has been consistently there for like more than two years, okay? Um, so, so for instance, th these are the kind of criteria you have to have two more, two, two or more of these. Again, for adults, they have to be there for at least two years persistently. For kiddos, about one year. Uh, but while depressed, they have to have two of these: either poor appetite, insomnia, hypersomnia, low fatigue, low self-esteem, poor concentrations, and feelings of hopelessness. Okay. Um, and so this one becomes concerned because this one actually is more of an organic issue. So this is something that uh, if, if one is correct, like I said, it's a low grade depression. It just puts you in a, I just really don't give a shit type of state. Uh, it, it's one of those because it's persisted so long, it's probably going to need some type of low-grade medication to, to alleviate those symptoms, especially if within those two years, no major trauma has occurred. So it's just sitting there, absence of any events. Uh, we have some other types of, of uh, mood disorders and whatnot. Uh, one of them is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, this is basically uh, a depression kind of incredible mood swing that occurs just before uh, the menstrual cycle cycles begin. Okay, um, how do I explain this one? Uh, if you've ever had any friends who just become debilitated just before their period, this is what that is. Okay. Uh, it's just marked by extreme mood swings, irritation, let's see, ir irritability, anger issues, marked depression, hopelessness, uh, anxiety, tension, uh, uh, and whatnot. Um, and in addition to that, they, they uh, experience some of these, such as decreased in interest in activities, lethargy. Again, you see the hyper and the insomnia. Uh, overwhelmed and out of control, okay? Um, and, and so this one is kind of one of those that is like a triggering hormonal event, okay? Um, and the reason why we become concerned about this, this particular disorder is it can cause uh, the person to engage in pretty high-risk behaviors to try and alleviate the symptoms. Like they may go on a drinking or a drug but drug bench every you know four weeks and when they know that this is going to become an onset. And so the biggest issue with this, other than the, this huge disruption that occurs for about a week each month, is the fact that they're at risk of engaging in high-risk behaviors in an attempt to alleviate the symptoms. Okay. So that's uh, that's an example of that. Everyone okay? What's that? Everything, you guys need to take a quick break. Well, we only have like 40 minutes, so. Okay. All right. I'm trying to think what I'm going to do. I think we are going to
I'm going to kind of try and hit on stress disorders, which include anxiety. So we're going to skip over bipolar and go to stress disorders, which include um, all of these. Okay? Uh, the anxiety disorders include things like separation anxiety disorders in children. This is usually something that occurs between the age of two to six. And, you know, a lot of children, when you, moms probably know this, when you drop them off, children experience little distress. They, they get kind of anxious and no mom, I don't want you to go, blah, blah, blah. So this is an extreme version of that. This is when the kid completely either becomes totally disengaged or they're gonna tear something up, okay? Um, and then we have things like specific phobias, which is just fear of spiders, fear of snakes, fear of social places. Social anxiety disorder is a, a, a disorder of a fear of socialness, people. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have panic disorders. I kind of want to hit on the social anxiety and the panic disorders because, uh, and, and the phobias, because I mentioned that the best way to alleviate these types of fear is using uh, uh, conditioning techniques that we talked about in the learning section, specifically things like exposure. So for like a, like a, 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 a certain phobia, I'll, I'll give an example of, uh, um, uh, did I give the steering wheel example in this class? I can't remember what class I've already talked about this in that time of year. All right, so, so uh, one person I worked with uh, a while back, um, she, she had this event occur to her. She was at this stop. Okay. This, her car was here. There was a, tr a car coming this direction. And there was a semi coming this direction. Okay. The semi had a green light. And this car, we don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he thought he, he had a red light a green light. He started to dart across it and the semi team and, and uh, uh, hit him. But this is, this is a thing that, 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 that the girl saw. She saw semi go across this car, knock the guy's head off, and his head actually rolled right to right here. And that's where his head ended up. Okay. So, this is the event um, that the girl experienced. And of course, you know, she did do counseling, a little bit of uh, crisis counseling, those kinds of things. Uh, but she came to my office because she couldn't drive after that. She said, um, Mr. Peterson, I get in my car, I can start it, I put my safety belt on, but then I just put my hands on the steering wheel, get ready to go, and I freeze. I can't go anywhere. My hand grips gets tighter, and I ju we just I can't drive. And someone has to come get me out of the car. Okay, and so uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up as far as a phobia is that uh, the 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 thing that she came to fear was not driving. Her actual fear was of steering wheels. You see, when she saw that head go across the road, she was gripping the steering wheel as she watched it bounce into the, the thing. <laughs> it's been pretty crappy, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's what she came to fear, okay? So how did we get rid of this particular phobia, okay? Well, the first thing we did is I printed off a picture of a steering wheel and I had her carry around the picture of the steering wheel, okay? And then, you know, those, those uh, uh, you might have it as a mommy, those little toys with the steering wheel on it, okay? Um, I had her come to my office and I had her interact with this, the, that steering wheel. 
for a Y. Okay. And then um, I, I went and took a steering wheel off of one of the maintenance trucks. It was still sitting there after two years. I, I don't know why it was. Because it's, they never asked me about it. Um, and I had her use a real steering wheel. Okay. Until she stopped having panics to holding the steering wheel. And then I had her sit in the car with the car off. And then I had her turn on the car, hold the steering wheel. I had her put the car into reverse while holding the steering wheel. We went through the parking lot and then we went around the block and then we went around two blocks till eventually she no longer had the fear of driving the car. Okay. Uh, I use this example because that's usually how you uh, take care of phobias is through <laughs> progressive exposure to the fear item. Okay. It gets a little bit tougher when you start talking about social phobias or social anxiety disorder. Okay. Because there's so many things that are associated with that particular disorder. Okay. And for example, uh, I had a friend who worked with social phobics and it was like you get them to stand uh, in the hallway in front of the front door. And then you get them to stand in the hallway with the door open. And then you get them to stand in the doorway. Okay. And then you get them to stand one step outside the door to the driveway, to the sidewalk. But the problem is, is with social phobics, if you don't desensitize something along the way, so let's say um, uh, they have a, a phobia of people approaching them, so you can get them out to the sidewalk, and if you didn't take into account other people coming in, what they'll do is they'll run right back into their house, and you have to start all over again from step one, step in front of the door with it closed, open, and so forth, okay? Social phobia is really actually really difficult to actually correct. Um, um, and uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because it has this, you remember we talked about that spontaneous recovery. Uh, the moment something in the environment triggers them, you have to start all over again, okay? Um, panic disorders are when a person, uh, they actually kind of mimic uh, miniature heart attacks. That's what they actually kind of feel like. Their chest tightens, they have a hard time breathing, they start feeling pain up and down their neck, they feel like they're going to faint. Uh, it really honestly feels like you're about to have a heart attack. Okay, And um, the issues with dealing with panic attacks is it's really, really difficult to find the trigger because it almost seems like it's occurring randomly. Um, just out of nowhere, they start to appear and there they are and, and uh, whatnot. An example of a person I worked with who had a panic attack was actually a freshman in college and about two to three months into college, she all of a sudden started feeling the severe panic attacks. Just She's like, I'll just be walking down the, the road and all of a sudden I get tense and it feels like I'm gonna die. I can't breathe, blah, blah, blah. And so we needed to figure out what it was. So um, I had my assistant kind of follow her around and just kind of observe when it is she was having panic attacks and what was going on, okay? Um, and what she found out is she noticed that she had panic attacks whenever two or more guys were walking behind her, okay? Now, this was strange because this girl has no history of abuse, no history of sexual assault, no history of any of those kinds of things, came from a fairly well-to-do family, so there was no trauma history to explain why she was having panic attacks with guys following her. Okay. What we did find out though is when the panic attack onset started to occur. Okay. 
Um, the big movement among dorms and dormitories in uh, uh, colleges and university is about Title IX, uh, which is the uh, prevents uh, students from sexually harassing and sexually assaulting each other. Okay, um, and that's the whole point of Title IX. And the her panic attacks started after hearing the series of horrific one in three women are going to be sexually assaulted in one of the talks she was listening to she, the, the presenter had nine girls stand up and she pointed at her and said you were sexually assaulted you were sexually assaulted and you were sexually assaulted just to make the point that one in three girls right and that was her her, her whole talk and she thought she was being experiential it was after that that you are, that's when she started having panic attacks when people were following her. So that's what I mean by the triggers are really hard to identify with panic disorders because they can just be something cognitively related, a speech in a class about sexual harassment. And that cognition then triggers a panic in an environmental condition. Okay, so that's kind of the, the difficulty behind panic disorders is you, it's really, really difficult to actually find the source of the triggering event. So, any questions on those? It is getting late. I'm going to Google it. Well, I mean, I thought it could be, I thought it was like them out of their house or out of their yes so these so yeah so this is a person who um so some someone with a social anxiety disorder is someone who is has fear of people a person with agoraphobia has a fear of being i don't want to say but it is it's a fear of being outside in the world and existing within the world, whether there's people there or not. Does that make sense? And so, yeah, this is the same situation where the same type of treatment would occur uh, for an agoraphobia versus a social anxiety person. I'm glad you brought that up. But uh, social anxiety is more specifically a fear of interacting with people, where agoraphobia is just a fear of interacting with the world as a whole. So. Uh, the most common of the anxiety disorders, that makes sense, is generalized anxiety disorder. <coughs> um, and again, this is one that uh, uh, has, has several notations, but the first one is excessive anxiety and worry, apprehensive expectations for more days than not in the last six months, okay? So, uh, for general anxiety disorder, the anxiety has to exist for the majority of the time for at least six months, okay? The reason why this one has a longer timetable than say like depression or something like that is because normal life anxiety can persist for at least three to four months, okay? Um, so we put it at six months just to kind of make sure that this is just not you going through normal life stresses that could exist for an extended period of time. Okay. Um, the individual finds it difficult to control things like worry, and they have to have at least three or more of one of these six. Okay. And now again, for children, only one of these items are, are necessary, but they need to feel restless or keep feeling keyed up on the edge, feeling easily fatigued, difficult concentrating, irritable, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance, usually staying awake and very restlessness. Okay? Um, they often will, will present with uh, uh, worry or physical symptoms. Um, so yeah, you got to differentiate this from a somatoform type disorder. 
Uh, the disturbance is not attributed to physiological effects such as substances or any other medical conditions such as hyperthyroidism. Okay. The disturbance is not explained by another mental disorder uh, as well, such as a phobia or obsessive compulsiveness. So you have to rule out both physical disorders and you have to rule out things like obsessive comp compulsive or social phobias before giving the diagnosis of general anxiety, okay? All right, makes sense? Okay. So I think that is, uh, it, do you, I'll, I'll ask all of you, do you, any of you have any questions about any of the disorders or curiosities that I can answer at this point? I think you asked about the bipolar and the schizophrenia. Yeah. And remember, so bipolar with schizophrenic symptoms, that's a, a, a schizoaffective disorder. So that, that's what that would be considered. Um, and, and that's and, and we want to differentiate that because that's a little bit more treatable than full-blown schizophrenia. Um, and so that's why those are differentiated. <laughs> All right, should we get this class wrapped up then? You know, baked and done? Okay, so first of all, let's talk about your final. So, this is your final, and I'll pass it around, but I want to go over the instructions first. So I'm going to hand out an instruction form first. Basically, you have a couple options. You can either take this on the web at the address listed, or you can take this paper form. Okay. And basically, what I want you to do is if you do it on the online, make sure you do it by May 9th, Wednesday, May 9th. Okay. If you complete the paper version, either have it to ELSA, take it to the faculty office at Maine. Um, I did provide my address in Tucson, if you live in Tucson or near Tucson, or you can mail it to the college by the 5th. If you mail it on the 5th, it'll get to me on time. So those are the kind of the four options if you do the paper ones to get it to me. Otherwise, just do it online. Okay. Your, your final only covers social psychology and abnormal psychology. I didn't do a comprehensive one. I didn't think you guys needed it. Um, but that, but uh, those are the things that I need. So by the 9th, make sure you have done exam one, the quiz, the final. And if you have missed one of the classes, make sure you give me an outline of the class you missed by watching the video, okay? So that's what I should have in my possession by May 9th. Is that so a deal? Quiz, which one? It's that quiz, uh, the quiz that I handed out uh, from the learning section. Yeah, person, personality? Yeah, that covered learning and personality. So what's your next day? Okay. So what was your next day? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. What about that personality? No, 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 it's more informational for you. So, um, any questions on finishing up the class? 
Okay, I have one more thing to do and then you're out of here. You need to do the class evaluation. Um, so what I'm gonna do is if Isabel, if, if you will hand these out and collect them all and then take them to Elsa once they're done, that'd be great. Um, but once you complete the, 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 the class evaluation, you can get out of here and enjoy your summer and the rest of the weekend. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in fall, right? <laughs> All right. Isabel is Isabel is in charge. Yeah. No, you, you have everyone.